So welcome to lecture 17 of information theory. Um, we had a nice um, boot process today. It only took like three minutes. So that was very good. Today's lecture 17, and we're going to fin be finishing uh, the discussion of Hamming codes and also start the discussion of differential entropy. Um, a couple of uh, announcements. So, so our final exam will be on, um, I think it's Tuesday the 11th. Is that right? It's the, it's the standard schedule time. There were a couple of conflicts that people had, so we will have it at our normal time on Tuesday, which is actually two weeks from today, I believe. So it's two weeks from today. So it'll be here in this room, two weeks from today. I think we have, I can't remember the time, but it's, it should be part of your schedule. It'll be during finals week, and it's relatively early in finals week. Um, today, um, I'll talk about it more next week. Um, uh, Today, uh, of course, you should be reading chapter 8 in this book. This is the differential entropy uh, um, book. Um, there's also, uh, you should have read chapter 7. And also, I mean, if you have uh, David Mackay's text, uh, he has a nice discussion. And some of the material that we're using for the Hamming codes was drawn from his text on Hamming codes. But I have to admit that we're, we're not even really doing Hamming codes justice. We're just basically touching the surface of Hamming codes and uh, just giving one simple example. But this is a huge field. This is a tip of an iceberg that we're touching. And coding is, a, is an enormous field. And we could spend 10 weeks on coding theory, and we wouldn't even still cover a lot of it. So there, there, I would recommend, uh, if you're interested in coding, um, doing one of two things. One, either uh, buy a book on it. There are lots of good books. Or alternatively, um, protest uh, the, um, the University of Washington. I shouldn't say this online, but basically make your viewpoint heard. If you, if you wish there to be a class on coding theory at the University of Washington, then make it known, because you, the students, have collectively a say in what courses are being offered. So. A class on encryption. So I believe that there is one. I know that Radha Povendran has a class in cryptography, I believe. And I think also there's a class in the CS department on cryptography of some sort, in the CS theory point of view. So I think there are already two classes, but there isn't currently a class on actual coding theory. Which would, what it would ultimately, what it would actually be is like a third quarter of the information theory. So it probably would be like information theory one, information theory two, and coding theory. Or maybe information theory one would be, you'd have to take that fat first, and then you could either take coding theory or IT2, or both, preferably. But it could be, it could, we could easily turn this into a three-quarter sequence, if there was interest. By the way, raise your hand if you signed up for IT2 next quarter. Good. Why are you not signed up? I would sign up. You haven't done it yet. And how, how come you're not signed up? See, this is, you know I was going to put you under pressure. Why are you not signed up? I'm sorry? You haven't done it yet. Okay. And why are you not signed up? I'm giving birth to a baby. Oh, that is the best excuse I've ever. Okay, you don't have to take anything. Did you hear that excuse? Giving birth to a baby. Let's let's con congratulations. Yeah, you have okay, you have the in fact instant A. You have an A plus in the class. You're doing the hardest work out of anybody. So um, congratulations. Seriously, that's, that's very that's very good. Um, I, I dare not ask anybody else. I, I, you, are you giving? You guys are not giving birth to babies. So you don't have that, that possibility. So okay. So homework seven. So we do have homework seven. So I decided two things both of which I think you will appreciate. One, um, rather than having it be due Thursday night, which is what we considered a, as a possibility last Thursday, and also rather than have it be due Friday night, which was something that there was some preference for, I decided uh, to make it due Sunday night at 11.45 p.m. Okay, so that means you can still have your Friday and Saturday and spend time on it on Sunday. And then the second thing, um, I decided that this is going to be the last homework. So do a good job on this one. After this, no more homeworks. So this is your last chance to do a really good job, if you haven't been doing a good job already, which I'm sure you all have been. Um, OK, so a couple of other things. So office hours are now Thursdays. But of course, thurs this Thursday, there is no office hours because it's Thanksgiving. Um, so uh, and also, you know, there's not a lot of time between now and Sunday. That's sort of non-holiday time. But my offer still stands to have 
if, if you don't, if, if email and the Canvas discussion boards don't fulfill um, your wishes to sort of interact with either me or the TA, I'm quite happy to schedule a Skype or Google Hangout um, chat with you. I mean, we could try Canvas, but I mean, I have a feeling that we'd end up spending 20 minutes just getting Canvas to work, like I did the last time I tried to do Canvas, whereas Skype and Google Hangout tend to work. So if you feel like chatting with me, just send me an email and we'll figure out a time over the weekend uh, to chat, and I'm happy to do that. Um, the other thing um, I wanted to say is I've, I've created an assignment. Okay, so here we go. So Tuesday, December 11th is our final. Uh, no, no, mon Monday. Wait, which day is our final? I, I can't remember. It's the 10th. Okay, so the 10th is the final. The, 10th, the final is on Monday. Tuesday, you have an assignment due. The assignment is upload your final exam. So what we will do is we will take your paper finals, just like we did with the midterm, if this isn't clear. We will take your paper finals. We will immediately scan them in right after the final, and we will mail them to you. Or I, should, I shouldn't say we. I, I, John Su was you leading this. I won't do it. So Tuesday is the 10th, actually. When is it? When is the final? Tuesday. The, Tuesday. the final is on the tenth on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. So then, and then, what day is the tenth? It's the tenth. The Tuesday. And okay. So let me fix this online. So so this should read Wednesday. Twelfth. Okay. The assignment currently has a due date of Tuesday the eleventh. I will fix that. You can't upload the Okay. Dates, you know, dates are hard things. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. That's good? Okay. Um, information theory is easy. Days of the week. We were thinking of adding a three-quarter sequence on telling time, days of the week, those sorts of things, those difficult things. But in any event, I think, I think is this clear? Does anybody have any question about this? The point is that we really need you to upload your scanned in final exam so we can grade it. We will only be grading it electronically. So you will get back grades as soon as we start grading it and as soon as we've uploaded. Um, will we um, get it in the same line? Possibly, possibly. Depends how fast we are. If we're fast, then yes. But but point is, um, if so if you upload them sooner, then we can grade sooner. No, I mean like we will get the PDF file. Oh, well, yeah, it will, like maybe, I don't know, half an hour after the exam. Oh, okay. Maybe an hour after the exam. It depends on how quick you are. And last time you were pretty quick. So point is, like, right from the exam, you're going to go to the copy machine, copy them in, mail them out, upload them, mail them out, and then you guys upload them. So you will have a copy of your final exam. Now the other thing is, we probably won't give you back paper copies. I and mean, if you want the paper copies back, you can have it, but you'll have to make a special appointment with me. But but uh, but as a result, you'll have a PDF of your final exam forever. So not taking up any space. In so that. 20, 30 years from now, when you're clearing out your basement, you won't find a copy of your information theory final exam. But what you will do is when you're clearing out your, your computer, you find, what is this PDF file? And then maybe someday your grandchildren will find it and, uh, and um, wonder what it is. So, OK, let's move forward. Um, so we've been talking about codes. And uh, just a reminder, this is from last time. Um, we talked about Shannon's theorem, and Shannon's theorem using the method of types and typicality theory essentially said that there exists a code such that if the rate, the entropy rate of the source, and remember we had this discussion about rate. Um, I hope that that's, that's clear now, what, what we mean by rate. Uh, I, actually, if you go back and you listen to, I think it's lecture five, I went back and I found it. We made specific mention of this idea of how we're dealing with and how we're, how we're using rate in this class. And it's not really a time thing. It's not. It's not based on time. It's it's something per per source symbol or per channel use. So, if you're still not happy about the notion of rate, then go back and listen to the first 20 minutes of lecture. I think it's lecture five, and it talks about how we're using rate, and it also gives us a forward reference to into the class, and that that, that maybe in the context of that earlier, earlier those earlier lectures might actually offer some assistance. But remember that what we said is that if the rate, if the if the, if the source rate is less than the, than the channel rate limit, so if the source rate lower bound is less than the channel rate upper bound, then there exists a code that 
as the block length increases, decreases with prob vanishing probability of error as the block length increases. But he didn't provide a code. And so this is sort of this um, uh, you know, typical set coding is not practical. Um, but uh, that sort of started this whole huge area of coding theory back in the late 40s, early 50s, and which continues to this day. Um, the very simple repetition code we saw does have the property that um, the probability of error does vanish, does go to zero exponentially fast with increasing block length. But the problem with this code is that the rate also goes to zero. So we can decrease the probability of, zero, of, it, of error, but then how much information we send also decreases and eventually goes to zero. So if we want to have, you know, if, if we want to have an unboundedly good code, we'd have to have an unboundedly slow code. And what Shannon code is that those two things don't go hand in hand, which is what was the conventional wisdom before he showed these results. So, um, and like I said, you know, coding is a huge area, and we're just touching on it with respect to you know this ex this particular example of Hamming code. And we talked about parity check codes, where we can take essentially like for example the first n minus one bits of a of a code of a of an information string and compute a parity bit, which is x sub n, and that basically means that any valid code word would have to have it be the case that it has always an even number of bits, and if there's ever an odd number of bits we would uh, detect an error, but we wouldn't be able to correct an error. And what we'd like, ideally, is not only codes where we can detect an error, but ones where we can correct an error. And also, of course, increasingly sophisticated codes trade off a couple of different things. There's the uh, ability to detect errors and the chance that there might be an error that goes undetected. There's the ability to automatically correct errors and to reduce the chance that there are errors that, can, that can't be corrected. There's the underlying complexity of the code, which is how difficult it is to decode, how much computational or memory resources do you actually need, because ultimately what we want to do with these is implement them on computers. And then the last thing we care about is the rate of the code. We want a code that has high rate, right, so that it doesn't add too much redundancy. So those are four things. Detection errors, correction errors, the computational complexity, and the rate. The, all of these four things trade off with respect to each other. Um, so we talked about a, a Hamming code, and I, I'm just going to review this a little bit. So uh, this was a, four seven, a 743 Hamming code where our rate is governed by the first couple of numbers. It's 407. We have four information bits, which are bits, and we have three redundancy bits, which are also bits. It's good that things we're calling bits are, in fact, bits and not something else. Um, and how do we do this? Well, we construct the code by adding four, sort of, you know, three additional parity bits. And the parity bits are not based on all of the information bits, they're only based on a subset of the information bits, in particular x1, you know, x0 through x3. And so what we can then do is sort of describe the code words using a set of, of linear equations mod 2. It's all modular 2 arithmetic. And since it's a set of linear equations, we can also describe it using a matrix vector multiply. And so code words consist of all x that satisfy h of x is equal to 0, where h is this, is this matrix here. So thus, the code words lie in the null space of h. We know that h has rank 3. Its null space, therefore, has got rank 4. And so in, the, in mod 2, that basically means that there are going to be 16 vectors that lie within this null space. Because again, remember, we're, everything is, is a binary vector. And so we can essentially just list all of the vectors that have, um, that lie in the null space. Okay. Questions on the review? So here are the 16 vectors that lie in the null space. So I figured out what had happened last time. There, there were some bugs. And of course, luckily, I decided to do an example. What had happened was I would copied um, this row into this row and only corrected one column. And so, of course, all of the code words were wrong. This is now corrected. So last time, all of, all of this, last time this whole thing was an error, and that's now fixed on today's slides. So here are the actual true uh, 16 vectors. Um, and, and what's nice about them, of course, is that 
the first four bits of these 16 vectors index the 16 possible information bits that we want to send, like here's 0000, 0001, 0010, and so on and so forth, up to 1111. Um, and so basically what we do then is we, we say, okay, well, we want to send 1010, so we find 1010, and then we send this whole code word. That's the code word for 1010. The three redundancy bits are 101. Um, there are a couple of properties about um, Hamming codes. We talked about the weight of a code. The first thing to note is, um, you know, adding and subtracting two code words because of the, the linearity of the of, of a matrix vector multiply. When you add and subtract two code words, you get other code words. Right? So it's closed under addition and subtraction. Code words are closed under addition and subtraction. And also, the minimum number of ones in any non-zero code word is three. And the minimum number of ones is called the weight of a code, other than the all zero code word. Right? Um, and why it's why it's the weight? Why is the minimum number ones three? Because it, you know, obviously, any code word with just one one can't be zero because we just choose the vectors, the column vectors, and all the column vectors are non-zero. Similarly, if since all the column vectors are different, if you add or subtract any two column vectors, you're not going to get zero. So the only possible way of getting um, a zero is by adding or subtracting three of the column vectors. And so that, that's basically all this stuff here. Whoops, that's all this stuff down here. It's this discussion. And then the other discussion is the idea of distance. And this is the critical thing, because remember, let me just add this. This is sort of getting back to this idea of um, sort of, you remember the picture we had where um, we had sort of the source, the source words here, and then what, and then the sort, the code words here, and then the, the noise profile. So we might, for example, say choose to. Um, I don't know if you can see this. It's moved up a little bit, but we might choose to um, send that guy, and that guy gets sent over to something that which is spread out, right, and. Um, Why is it not showing up on the screen? Let me see if I can move it down a little bit. Is that better? Okay, so the point is that if it's the case that the code words are well spread out, so like if a code word is very close to another code word, chances are if there's a small number of errors, we're going to hit it. And we're going to, if this code was here and then, it, and then we look at its noise profile, there's going to be overlap. And then we're going to get a received word here and there's going to be ambiguity. We're not going to know if we sent this or this, right? So we don't want that. What we would like is sort of the distance between any code words to be large. And so if we have a code word that's over here, if there's any, you know, the same type of distortion, it's going to make it such that there's no overlap, say, between this green region and this yellow region over here. And, and that's what we want. So what this is, this is really like, is this is the distance. Uh, this, this bit here is the distance between code words. And we want the distance to be large. And so the question is, in the Hamming code word case, what's the distance? Any questions on this picture and why this picture makes sense now in the context of Hamming code? Is this clear to everybody? So here, um, the distance. And so the distance basically means, like this, you know, this is a Hamming code. So we're using Hamming distance. And, and what is the Hamming distance? Hamming distance just counts the number of bit differences, right? That's the standard binary distance on binary strings. And what we'd like, uh, and you know, what we have in this particular case is that the minimum distance between any two code words is three, which is much better than if it was, say, two or one or worse, worst of all, zero, right? Which basically means that there, we have two different code words for, or two code words, I should say, identical code words for two different messages, which in this particular case can't even happen because when you have different messages in the first four bits, you're going to have a different code word. But why would it be different in only two places? I can't remember if we covered this on Thursday. Does anyone remember? I think, I guess we did. Maybe, because it's in the review section. But basically, we can't have a difference. Um, um, uh, of, of two, of, can't have a distance of two code words in only two places, because if we do, what that would mean 
is that sum, the sum or difference of two columns would equal to zero. And, but we know that that's not true. That can't be a can't contradiction because the sum of any sum or difference of any two columns of the h vector is non-zero, and so therefore we can't have these guys differ in only two places. Right. So then this bottom thing is is why we care about that, which I've already said. Okay, so now the question is, how do we do decoding? I mean, we, we know that maximum likelihood decoding, if we actually have access to the channel and we can compute the probability of all the different possible source messages for each thing, um, maximum likelihood decoding in general is computationally very difficult. And, you know, this is a 743 code, and of course it's very easy to sort of iterate through all possible code words and compute the one that has the highest probability. But in general, when you have bit strings, of length 256 or 1024 or 2048, we can't iterate through all 2 to the 2048 possible bit strings to find the one with the highest probability. And in general, when one for many and for most interesting and, and good code coding algorithms, doing maximum likelihood coding is, is intractable. It's, it's like an NP-complete problem or even worse. Sometimes it's worse. Information theoretically complex, and so therefore we need a good coding scheme. And in, in Hammond codes, we we do have one called syndrome coding, syndrome decoding, which is what we're going to talk about now. And so the idea is, let's for 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 the moment just assume that we've got a BSC, a binary symmetric ch channel, which is sort of a nice channel for doing a lot of analyses. So it sort of mimics a lot. It's basically a binary channel where you have some probability p of there being a crossover. Right. So remember the the BSC. And so we send x, which is this. And then what we get back is y, which is this, which is going to be equal to you know, the original x plus some noise profile z. And so z is the noise. And so here's the received, um, here's the received vector sort of written out. Um, um, now, what we get is y on the receiver end. What we'd like to know is x. Okay, So we can compute what's called the syndrome. So s is the syndrome. And that's just basically applying h times y. Now, what do we get? So h times y we know to be x times x plus z. right? So this is equal to x plus z. But h of x, since x was a code word, we know that h of x is equal to 0. So therefore, what we get, the syndrome, is equal to h times z, which is the noise profile. Right? Now, we don't know what the noise profile is. But if we did know what the noise profile was, we could solve for x, right? So as soon as we know z, we can get x, because we, we have y. We don't know z, but we can get this. So, so we have this equation here. s is equal to h times z. So here's, here's essentially the, um, the, the equation. s is equal to h times z, or it's basically just like s is equal to a linear combination of, of these columns. Right, so here's, we have these noise profiles, and in particular, the syndrome, we know that the column vectors of H are distinct, and, if, and the, z, the noise vector Z indicates whether there's a noise, whether there is a crossover or not at that particular channel use. And if there was one and only one error, then the syndrome would equal to the column of H, which indicates which error it is, which, which bit is an error. Right? So if there's one error, that's pretty good, right? Because it basically means we can correct for it. So, um, does that make sense? So here's here's sort of repeating what I've already said. We've got y, right? We have y. We've received y. X is what we want, and if we know y and we know z, we can get x. Everybody do a thumbs up if it makes sense. OK, so you guys, I'm just really boring. Cause nobody, is that what's going on? OK, so that's a very simple thing. So, so we only need to solve, solve this. And so when we have this equation, z, s is equal to h times z, how many possibilities? Well, there's 16, 16 possible solutions, 16, 16 possible z's that would satisfy that. And here they are. So here, let's say, for example, we received this particular y. We received this y here. Okay, and that's not a code word. We check and say it's not a code word. So what do we do? Well, we solve s is equal to h times y, which is also equal to h times z, which is equal to 101. So that's our syndrome, 101. 
and it, we have the 16 solutions for Z, I should say 16 solutions for Z within S is equal to H times Z are, you know, so Z really is in this set of 16 possible bit vectors. Now you might think, okay, 16, that's really bad. That's, how am I going to know which one it is? Well, first of all, the, the good news is that 16 is better than 128, right? So amongst all of the 128 possible noise vectors you could have, right, if there are 128 of them, um, you've now eliminated it down to only 16 possibilities by using information about the syndrome. So that's good. Right? If you choose randomly out of 128, you're going to do much worse than if you choose randomly out of, 100, out of 16 on average. However, there's a little bit more you can do. So we know the channel, and we know that it's a BSC, and we know the probability P, and we know that P is not equal to 1 half. Or let's just, without loss of generality, say that P is less than 1 half. So, um, so the most probable solution, the most probable noise vector, is it going to have more bit flips or less bit flips? Fewer, right. So the most probable one, since p is less than one half, is going to have, we know that there's an error if it's not a code word, right? So the most probable one is going to have one bit flip, right? And then the second, if there's two bit flips, it's p squared, and it's probability p squared plus all the, it's, it's actually n choose, 7 choose 2 times p squared. Right. So actually, that's, it's, that's not exactly correct because, again, we know the syndrome. So it's a little bit trickier than that. In fact, your homework problem, um, the last homework problem is on this. By the way, did anyone notice that, did anyone look at the homework early this morning? So when I posted the homework, it was late last night and I was very tired, and I accidentally posted the solutions instead of the homework. <laughs> so if you, were, if you were quick, you could have gotten the solutions and downloaded it. And then this morning I woke up and I was not exactly awake, and I just, I don't know, for some reason I always look at the homework again. And I, I went to the web page and I downloaded the homework and I said, oh no, it's the solutions. And so I quickly <laughs> deleted it and then redid it again without the solutions. So, but, and I hope that nobody got it. Nobody got it's it. So. In Google, maybe. Well, I don't think Google's that fast. It might be. And now everyone's going to go check, right? By the way, talking about Google, did anyone, you know, there is an assignment, I think, or not, it's not really an assignment, it's a discussion to, to do that Google string. Did, did we make that an assignment? It wasn't the discussion I saw. It wasn't an assignment, just a discussion. Did anyone actually do that? So Maybe I'll make that an assignment. I'll make that an assignment. And actually, what you can do is you don't have to you don't have to post a PDF. You just you, I think you can just add it, add a. But you can't see each other's assignments. So this is something. The whole whole idea is to show each, everybody. If everyone could just do that, so they don't have to make an assignment, or maybe I'll make an assignment anyway. But it shouldn't take you more than ten minutes. And it's just it's just kind of fun. And essentially, when you go back to that just that lecture on on probability, uh, um, an entropy of English that's actually quite relevant and informative. Um, okay, so um, can you remind me to make that an assignment? Or maybe you can make that an assignment. Okay. I'll remind you. So. How do we know Z? We don't know Z. The question is, how do we know Z? We don't know Z. What we're trying to do is figure out what Z is. So we have, we have these possibilities. Right, which is which are only we only have 16, which is better than 128. But what we want to do is come up with some sensible way for choosing amongst these 16. Okay, okay. now w rather than just random guessing, so more sensible than random guessing. One of your bullets said that we know uh, y and z. Where where did I say that? I said that if you know z, you know. Ah, it's was a condition. Yeah, if we know, we, so we definitely know y. Y is the string we received. If we can somehow figure out z, we can get x. And z is, is, is only, there's only 16 possibilities in general. Like once we've got y, it limits z. And that's the idea of this code, right? It significantly cuts down the possible Just noise things. Just by h to Gives us the syndrome. Now the syndrome, has, multiplying by h gives us, is, is, has this form, right? And so the question is, we know it's a Hamming code, sorry, we know it's a BSC, and we know that the most probable 
error is when there's one error, and that has, and similarly, um, in in each one of these cases, there's only one possible solution with weight one. Why? And because this is the syndrome, right? So the syndrome S here is just this linear combination of the columns of H. Okay. So when there's only one error, when we get S. There's only one way of getting, let, let's say that Z2 was 1. Okay, so that would be this column. And so if S is equal to column vector 1, 1, 0, there's only one way of getting 1, 1, 0 with a 1-bit error Z. And that's by the vector where Z2 is 1 and all the rest of the Zs are 0. So the syndrome then tells us what... Um, the bit vector error, the, what, the, what bit is an error in the case when there's one. There's, if you had it, you know, any other one bit error would give us a different syndrome. So the syndrome uniquely determines that any, any one bit error, and that's what this point is here. Right. So um, in, the most, in the previous example of that, that string that I said we received, uh, that example had, that, so let's just go back to that example. So the example was, suppose we receive this thing. Suppose we receive uh, this string here. Okay. So in that case, when we receive 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, then uh, there's um, only one possible single bit error vector, which is this, where, where there's a bit error in, in Z1 and all the rest are 0. And so then this gives us back at this, and then this gives us the information bits. So this, this is presumably the message. So under the most likely scenario, when there's a one-bit error, that's how we do the decoding. And, and that's what this point is saying, is that, that for any syndrome S, there's a unique minimum weight solution for Z in this equation, S is equal to HZ. And the weight has no more than one. And that's, again, because it's a linear combination of the columns. Now, um, the last, the, the other point we need is, well, suppose the syndrome is zero. So if the syndrome is zero, then, then the unique solution is just says z is equal to zero. Right. So that would be the, um, that would be the, uh, the most probable z in that case. So that's the only case we have the special case. Because that is, uh, when, you know, single bit errors, that, that, that would be, that, that, that doesn't give us the ability because every single one of the columns is non-zero. So then, for any other S, the syndrome must be one of the columns of H. And so then we can generate, we can generate, oh, this is just saying the same thing over again, basically, we can get S by choosing that column, or turning that bit on in Z, whatever. I mean, that's the same thing, right? OK. Clear? So mine? So here's then the syndrome decoding. Now this is something also that that's going to be on that's on your problem set. Is to it's a really easy problem, or at least this problem is really easy. But you have to understand this material. And you have to look at the slides. Basically, we receive y, we compute the syndrome s by computing h of y, which is equal to h of z. Right? Uh, if s is equal to zero, we just set z equals to zero, and if it's not, locate the column in h. Um, corresponding to the syndrome, turn that bit on in the z vector, subtract um, or add since it's mod 2, it doesn't matter, subtraction and adding is the same thing, so you add z to y and then we get back x. And then we report back the first four bits. Why is it called the syndrome? Well, it's, syndrome is some, is a word, let's see, the root of syndrome is like symptom. And it's sort of an indicator of the problem. So if it's if it's zero, it's probably an indicator of not of not a problem, at least under the under. But if if it's if it's non-zero, then it's sort of an indicator of, of the problem. In 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 this particular case, in the one-bit error case, and um, so the it's sort of the identity of what of of the column in H whose index indicates. Or, sim or is, the si is the symptom of the problem. So I think that's why it's called syndrome. I don't know who first used the word, but I think that's why.
the syndrome. Or symptom. They could have called it a symptom. Um, it's a good question. I like these kind of name questions. I'm always curious why people call things things. Um, it makes a big difference sometimes. If you find a good name for a problem, it can lead to it being widely used in the future or being forgotten forever. So it's worth spending a little bit of time on a name sometimes, um, but not too much time because you could spend a week on a name and not get any progress done. So the procedure of syndrome decoding can then do um, and can correct, can not only detect, but it can correct any single bit error. So the most likely thing, error that might happen is, is the uh, is a single bit error, and, and we can correct that. So this sort of satisfies, and it's very simple to decode. So and its and its rate is is four sevenths. So it's not a bad it's not a bad thing. Um, you can have a you can have a probability of error, and it's correctable deterministically. So you know, there's there's a whole class of errors that you can absolutely correct. So it's if you can detect something, you can correct something. It's got a reasonably good rate, and um, not obviously that good, but it's something, and it's computationally cheap. So on the, on the, on this front, on this sort of four front front, four topic front that we want, detect, correct, computationally cheap, and good rate, it's it's sort of advancing a little bit. Now a little bit more on this is we can visualize it using Venn diagrams, which is at least useful in this in this case. So the idea is that we have each parity condition corresponding to a circle. Let's zoom in a little bit on this one first. So, like for example, maybe like the the red circle is is one parity condition, and the blue circle is another parity condition, and then the green circle is another parity condition, right? So that's each of these are parity conditions, and so we have the information bits which lie in in the, in the middle, right? So they they sort of like we have x zero, x two, and x one, and x three. Those are the information bits, and then the parity conditions. <clears throat> or x4 and x6 and x5. And so that's kind of nice. Um, and then here's an example of a particular pattern. Is this, does this satisfy the parity condition? Is this, a, is this in the null space of H? These bits on the right? So it, 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 if this isn't clear, it, it's because it's not understanding the figure, figure on the left. So. The idea is that every in, inside of every circle, the number parity must be satisfied. So the number of bits on must be one, must be even. So go to each circle. Are there an even number of bits on in the red circle? Are there an even number of bits on in the blue circle and in the green circle? And is the answer yes? In each case, yes. So so therefore the parity is checked. And, it checks. and so this makes it really easy to just see if it's satisfied by using this kind of Venn diagram thing. So, um, so you know, what we would do is like we would set the first four bits, like you know, the information bits are decided by the message. So for example, we'd set this bit, this bit, and this bit, and this bit. And then in order to satisfy parity in this circle, we have to set this guy to a one. And to satisfy parity in this circle, we have to set this bit to a zero, because it has to be even number of bits. Similarly, in this circle, we have to set it to a one. I should probably use different colors there, but you get the idea. Okay. okay. All right, so here's the assignment of the, of the bits to figures. You've already seen this. So now we can actually look at the syndrome as a condition when the parity bits are not satisfied. So here in the upper left again is, is, the, is the pattern. And so, like for example, here's an example where, um, where parity is, is not satisfied. And why? Well, because there's two circles, um, both of which are sort of surrounded in dotted lines, and I'll circle them as yellow. Um, these two circles are not, don't satisfy parity because it's an odd number of bits. Now, what single bit can be flipped to satisfy parity? That's this one. That's the most, that's the, that's how you would correct the code. Because okay. if you flip, flip that one that's labeled star to a zero, then the two dot, the two yellow circles become, are, are fixed. Similarly, 
in this particular case, um, there's one circle that doesn't satisfy parity. And what single bit can be flipped to fix it? So what, th th why do we want a single bit? Because remember, single bit changes are the things that have the most probable, th that, cor that corresponds to the most probable error, right? So, because um, single bit changes with a BSC is, is most probable. And so therefore, we would look for that one single bit. Now, we might be changing an information bit, or we might be changing a parity bit. Like in this particular case, we changed an information bit because it was in inside of the it was one of the actual on well, this particular I guess it was it was Z1 that's an information bit here we're changing Z4 which is a parity bit and in this particular case all three parity checks are not satisfied however there's still one bit flip that we can change which is this one Z2 which suddenly makes everything satisfied. But there's other, other conditions, however. Like, what about in this particular case? In this example, there's um, the idea is that there are two errors. So we have, so it, it's, there's not actually one error, there's two errors. And so the two errors are marked with uh, a star. And so if we were to truly and actually fix the errors, what we would do is turn this 0 into a 1 and turn that 1 into a 0. And that would actually fix the errors. However, if we do parity decoding, or if we do syndrome decoding, what that will do is it will, will, will change this 1 to a 0, which will satisfy parity. But what we'll end up getting is three errors. So we'll actually introduce an error. We'll make it worse by correcting an error. And this is something that's also typical of these. Like as, soon as, as soon as it gets beyond the realm of correctability, the correction step actually makes it worse. So either you can correct it or you make it worse. But so, so obviously we want to design codes, and this is where the research is about. We want to design codes where the probability of correction is high, very, very high, Maybe the probability of detection is even higher because if you can if you can detect an error that's not correctable, at the very least you can have the pinwheel of death or something, right? Or you know you can do something which tells the user or, or whatever, please send tell me again or what did you say or retransmit or do something that indicates that something's wrong, other than just blindly going forth and pretending that what God is correct. And then the worst case, the thing that you want there to be the least probable of is this undetected, uncorrectable, uncorrectable, undetectable error, which would be this case here in the, in the 743 code. OK, any questions on, on this? Yep. So is there any reason why you couldn't just double the block length here and, and find the right matrix to get like, this will generalize easily to bigger Oh, yeah. I mean, this is just a 743 code. I mean, oftentimes you might have 243, you know, I mean, it's just th these block lengths can get bigger and much, much longer, and then the parity checks get much longer. And, and uh, this, of course, generalizes. But Hamming codes are not state of the art. In fact, there are many, many coding algorithms. There's Reed Solomon codes used by the old CD players. There's Bose, Chowdhury, and I'm not, I don't know how to pronounce this name, code, uh, the convolutional codes, turbo codes and low-density low parity check codes are very, very extraordinarily successful on real-world channels. So the, the two, two codes, I think the, if you're interested in coding, probably, I mean, you should read all of them, but these are sort of, the, these codes here are, are state-of-the-art, the turbo codes and the low-density parity check codes. I've mentioned them before, but they all are based on some idea of actually adding parity. The, the turbo codes, what they do is like, it's, it's convolutional code, which is actually a code based on a convolutional process. And what a turbo code does is it's two convolutional codes connected together by a random permutation matrix. And, and it's, the, it's similar to the low density parity check code because the, you're sort of adding random parity checks. And it seems like nature has a really hard time fooling randomness, just truly true randomness. And so if you have randomness in your code, it's unlikely that nature will come up with something that has exactly that pattern of randomness. So 
So these don't assume that uh, adjacent bits are independent of the Um. I guess so. I mean, I'm, what I mean by work is the following. I mean, like, if you if you use them for real world channels, the kinds of noise, and then obviously in real world channels, it's not the case that two bits are independent. But when you when you do use them in real world channels, and you see how well they can do at correcting and detecting, and how computationally tractable they are, and and what kinds of rates you can get out at what kind of bit error when you measure these things. I mean, these are in general you you sort of have to empirically measure them on real physical channels. And on real physical channels, these two these two coding methods tend to work very very well. Um, and that's thanks to nature, the the, chan the nature of nature being in a particular way. There could be a different parallel universe which where nature is very different, and these codes would work terribly. It's just the, it's just the way that the noise patterns of real world channels happen to be that it's it doesn't well match the noise, these random kinds of patterns that you add into the LDPC codes and turbo codes. And to, to really make that sense, make sense, you really sort of need to look a little bit more at these coding strategies. But, but then and to really understand that, you need to understand convolutional codes and some of these Reed-Solomon codes and other things. And we would need to do more, more on Hammond codes. So if, we were, if this was a coding theory class, we would do that. And we would, we would try to gain a better intu intuition. But we're not doing coding theory, really. But I wanted to give a little bit of a taste of coding theory. What's going on? It's a really important thing. Is anyone actually, I mean, if you're doing wireless communication, you, you do wireless, right? So do you, do you Design codes, or you just assume coding is not, my field. Coding's not your field. Yeah, so so if coding is your field, then then you would be doing research on this. This is still a research topic. I mean, we're still trying to achieve, um, you know, the Shannon Shannon rate in some sense. There's a lot of other questions that people are trying to do as well. Okay, this is a good time. Yeah, I guess yeah, I, I mentioned this. So there's a possibility we'll discuss this a little bit next quarter. So we're actually we're we're ahead um, in this class. Um, so we might have a little bit of extra time next quarter at the end, and maybe I could do one lecture on turbo codes or something if you're interested in it. Um, but there's a lot of other cool stuff coming up next quarter, which we're going to be doing. Um, one of the things I want to start talking about is entropy. Do you remember entropy? So uh, let's take a break and then let's talk about entropy. Okay, so entropy. So why, why would we spend a lecture so late in the quarter talking about entropy? Well, that's because we haven't really talked about all things entropy yet. And in particular, the quantities and the entropic quantities that we've been discussing have all been... Um, have, have all involved uh, discrete random variables. And you know, not all random variables are discrete, and the world isn't discrete. The world is continuous, and channels are continuous, and uh, noise is continuous. And so, uh, ideally, we would like to have a theory of compression and communication and capacity, and all these things that we've talked about in discrete co domains, but have it applicable to to um, continuous domains. And in particular, the famous formula that relates the capacity of a channel to the signal to noise ratio, um, which is extraordinarily intuitively satisfying isn't something that we can derive, which we will be deriving next quarter, probably the first couple of lectures next quarter, but we can't derive that without actually having a, a notion of continuous entropy. So x now, let's let it be a continuous random variable, which means that we have a, a distribution function, not a, not a probability mass function. So a probability mass function is something that gives a, sort of a, a single probability for every individual possible symbol. And here it really makes sense only to talk about um, the cumulative probability of a, of a random variable being less than a particular value. And we can talk about its derivative, which is the density function. But we can't really say that a given x has probability f of x, because then if we would integrate, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Like every, everything lives in a set of measure 0. And um, you know, sets of measure zero don't happen. So we can only really talk about cumulative things happening. Or cumulative, the probability of cumulative things happen. Now this also, just to, to make things simple, define the support set. We're not saying that this that f has to be a non-zero, but we are defining a set that corresponds to the subset of x that's that is measured, you know, according to f. 
Um, and then we can define the differential entropy in the following way. So what we do, it's, it's analogous to entropy. I mean, we're using, instead of a sum, or, an, or we're using an integral. And of course, I think at this point, everyone should know that sums and integrals are basically the same thing. Right? They're just continuous with discrete. And uh, we just take the, the negative sum of what, what, what became, what was the negative sum of p log p is now the negative integral of f log f, integrated over all x. And that's our definition of the differential entropy. So right away you see its similarities. Uh, one difference is that you're integrating only over the support set of x, of, of not, not everything. So we don't have to worry about log 0. So otherwise, well, something would happen. We'd have to worry about that. Now, let's do some examples. Examples will give... Now, when you see this, you say, well, let me gain some intuition as to what's going on here. Uh, then let's do that with the example. So let's start out with a uniform, ran uniform distribution. It's a continuous distribution uniformly distributed between 0 and A, where A is some strictly positive real number. So R++ means strictly, strictly positive. So then when we compute the entropy, we plug it in. And so we, it's, it's the sum over the support set, which is from 0, or the integral over the support set, which is from 0 to A. And then we have the probability and log of the probability, which when we evaluate this whole thing ends up being negative log 1 over A. Or, I mean, the whole thing is just equal to log of A. Right. Now, the first thing to note is that the entropy need not be only positive. It can be negative. In fact, it can, it can get arbitrarily small, because A can get very, very small. And log of A become, can become very, very negative. Similarly, we see that there's no upper bound either, because A can get very, very big, and log of A can get very, very big. So there's no upper bound to entropy, there's no lower bound to entropy. Why, why could this be? Why does it make sense to have a negative entropy? It still makes sense if you do uh, But we're, well, yeah, I mean, if you take differences, for example, which we'll do. But just forgetting about differences, or compare, why from, from the perspective of its own self, when you're not comparing two things, does it make sense? That, that I want you to think about that. We will answer the question momentarily, but before we answer it, let's think about it. So I remember when I was first learning about this in the ancient dinosaur age, in the the Paleolithic era, I was wondering how, when I first learned about differential entropy, I was wondering, well, how could it be negative? Why does it make sense? Well, let's try to answer it in this way. So remember, um, how we, when we talked about typical set theory, we used entropy as, as an exponent. Remember, ex entropy was an exponent in, in something that wasn't really like the volume of the set, but was, was like the count of a set, like, like a cardinality of a set. Like we said, two, two things to note. So if we, have a uniformly, if we have a uniform distribution in the discrete world, right? let's say we have... Um, it's how best to explain this. I think I, prob I might have slides, but let me just write it down. Um, if we have a uniform distribution over m items, then the entropy is going to be log of m. Right? Now, um, if we have a uniform distribution over, say, 2 to the n items, then the entropy, this is the number of items, this is the entropy, then the entropy is going to be m. Right? Now, if we, if we take something, like let's say that y has entropy h of y. Okay. And um, 
then we find and then then we solve this this equation so we say that this is equal to n where this n is this so in some sense the entropy of an item is equivalent to the exponent of something that has two to that exponent number of items uniformly so you can say that if you have a uniform distribution over um, over two to the n possible values it has entropy n and anything with entropy n if you take any any random variable with entropy y in some sense the uncertainty about that random variable regardless of what that distribution is is kind of equivalent to the uncertainty of a random variable that's uniform that has two to the n possible values I think that that's actually a correct way of saying it so Therefore, we can see the entropy is kind of like, um, when we take 2 to the entropy, that's kind of like the equivalent number of possible values that a uniform random variable over that many possible values would have. Does that make any sense? Okay, so let me, let's see, now that I've said that, here's, an, here's another example. So, Again, discrete entropy. So 2 to the, two to the h, 2 to the h of x, this is discrete entropy. This is the number of things that can happen on average. And in general, in general, 2 to the h is going to be much less than the alphabet size, right? We know that it's only the case when it's uniform is this going to be the same. 2 to the h is going to be equal to the alphabet size. And it depends on the probability distribution. Now, continue a uniform random variable y such that 2 to the h is equal to y. So then the entropy is kind of like the exponent in the number of items that, that have equal probability. It's the exponent of the count of the number of items that have equal probability. So whenever we say something has entropy, we can say, well, how much uncertainty is there? Well, there's the entropy uncertainty. Well, that's kind of like just like having a uniform distribution with 2 to the h number of items. That's like the same difficulty or the same uncertainty or the same perplexity or the same complexity or the same hardness or the same information, amount of information that you get. And so every distribution, all distributions that have, have the same entropy are in some sense the same. They're equally informative. And so all distributions that have the same entropy are then equivalent to the uniform distribution that has that entropy. And the uniform distribution that has that entropy has this many items. So therefore, you can think of the entropy as the exponent of the count of a uniform distribution with that entropy. And all distributions with that entropy have the same information. So now when let's 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 take that idea and see if we can apply this to the differential entropy. Is, does this make sense? Is this clear? It's point of the count, the whole set, or just the equally likely uh, elements? Well it's so it's it's the exponent of the count. So why is a uniform distribution here? I should I should no, be saying it. it's not in the form. Well it, we're just what we're saying is that the entropy is the exponent of the count of some uniform distribution that has the same entropy. Right. So we can say that think about the entropy as defining equivalence classes of probability distributions, right? So entropy lies between you know zero and some value, right? And um, I mean, in general, over all possible distributions, over all possible cardinalities, entropy can between, be between 0 and infinity, right? Um, now, for each possible value of entropy, consider all of the discrete distributions in the universe that has that entropy. And then for any particular cardinality, choose the uniform distribution that has that entropy. So all distributions are sort of equivalent in, sort of, in terms of complexity or in terms of information to that uniform distribution. So therefore, the entropy can be seen as kind of like a, a volume ish, a volume kind of quantity, or, or like a, an exponent of a count of that uniform distribution. Because in the, in the case that it is a uniform distribution, it's exactly the exponent of the count. Here's the count, the cardinality of y. So this is the count here. And here's here's the exponent of the count. Right? It's two to the two to the h. So each distribution. What I mean by the exponent of the count, I mean it's like 
if you make this equality, it's like two to some exponent, and so the cat is equal to two to some exponent, and h is the exponent in that two, with the base two. That's what I mean by exponent of the count. I don't mean that we're taking the count and exponent. Yeah, so each distribution is translated into a volume. That's right. That's exactly right. And, 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 but what we will see is that differential entropy is literally a volume as opposed to just a count. So, um, in fact, what we'll see is that if, it's, if we think of the entropy as an exponent, then it makes sense to have negative because it just means that the volume is going to be small which is okay, right? We can, make, we can make the volume really, really small. It just means that things are really, really concentrated. And, and zero doesn't mean anything. It's just some number on the way from negative numbers to positive numbers. You know, if, if entropy is zero, in the differential entropy case, it doesn't mean that it's certainty. It just means that the volume is sort of intermediary. You know, as we make the entropy more negative, it, the volume gets smaller. As we make the entropy bigger, the volume gets bigger. So let's, let's give an ex another example, Gaussian distribution, the Gaussian entropy. This is a really important example. So we have a normal distribution. This is a, a unidimensional normal distribution. We'll talk about the multivariate version in a minute. So it has um, the mean and the variance. The mean is going to be 0. The variance is sigma squared. And the normal distribution has, has, dist has a density that looks like this. So what do you think? So when we, we want to compute the entropy of this, do you think the mean is going to matter to the entropy? Like why do we set the mean of the Gaussian to be 0? Yeah, is that going to change the entropy? No. no. Um, anybody else? It's just the location. It's just the location. So I mean, it's like the, you know, entropy is like the uncertainty. So, like, if I take a distribution and I and I a discrete distribution and it's distributed between negative one hundred and negative ninety, and I shift it by adding hundred to the to the values, is that going to change the entropy? No. If I if I add five to the mean of a Gaussian, is that going to change the Entropy, it shouldn't. So, therefore, we take a zero mean Gaussian with the variance sigma, and let's compute the entropy in Nats to, to begin with. But it's just easier to work with natural logarithm for a minute. So there's h of x, and there's negative the integral of f log f. It's natural logarithm, and so as soon as we take the natural logarithm, we get um, this quantity, which is this bit. Um, and we get the log of the square root of 2 pi sigma squared. And then when we sort of rearrange it a little bit, we've got e of, e of x squared. And what is e of x squared? Yeah, so it's sigma squared. So that, and that cancels out, right? Well, not, not the 2. There's the second moment down there at the denominator. So we got 1 half plus 1 half log 2 pi sigma squared, and then let's try to simplify it a little bit. Let's add a log e, or natural log e, which is just 1. So we, now we can combine it into the quantity um, 1 half log 2 pi e sigma squared. Or if we want to convert it back into units of bits, we just do unit conversion, and we get our answer. So I, I always liked, I think this is an interesting quantity. This is the entropy of the of a, a Gaussian with um, variance sigma squared. A couple of things to note. It has a 2 in it, it has a pi in it, and an e in it, all multiplied together. So it's sort of one of these amazing quantities that pi and 2 and e all show up together. How many things have pi, 2, and e together in the same, multiplied together right next to each other? So that's kind of bizarre. I mean, like you might think, why would there be a pi and an e together? But pi and e are, some, are important numbers. Um, so there's the entropy. The other thing is that you know the, those guys are constants. Pi and e and two and one half are constants. The only thing that really matters for the entropy is what? What property of the Gaussian is there? The mean is gone. I mean, if you know, as you were saying earlier, you know, when we when we look at this thing here, no matter what the mean is, it's going to be the same, right? We could, if we wanted to be a little bit more formal about it, we would stick the mean and do change of variables, get rid of the mean, and mean wouldn't matter. So the only thing that survives that affects the entropy is what? Is the variance. sigma, sigma squared, the variance. 
So what it's saying, and also it's monotonically related. So basically, saying that the entropy of the Gaussian is proportional to the log of the variance, which means that when things are very spread out, you have more uncertainty. When things are very concentrated, when the variance is small, you have less uncertainty. And this is the relationship. So that's a very intuitively satisfying result, that variance, when you measure the variance of something, you are measuring the entropy under the assumption that that thing that you're measuring is Gaussian. Modulo a log transformation. But still, I mean, the variance gives you the same information as what the entropy gives you. So that's very, very nice. I mean, every all these times, all these years you've been computing the variance, that's actually the entropy of a Gaussian in some sense. So, um, so what else do we have? So um, the other thing is, like, it, of course, it's monotonically related to the variance. So that's that's important. I mean, that 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 goes sort of sort of goes without saying. I mean, you look, you look at the expression and it's monotonically related, but we wouldn't expect as the variance increases to suddenly see the entropy to drop and then start increasing again. That wouldn't make any sense. Okay, um, so we do have an asymptotic equipartition property in, in the continuous case. You, know, you, you won't escape asymptotic equipartition properties. You will see many of them in your lives, probably. But let's let's before we get to that, let's let's talk a little bit more. So remember, in the in the discrete case, we have uh, the probability of this block of n random variables is approximately equal to two to the negative n h, and the size of the typical set is about two to the n h. And when we look at two to the n h. We can write it as 2 to the h to the n. Right? And that's easy. So in some sense, you can think of 2 to the h as like a side length of an n-dimensional hypercube. <coughs> and 2 to the n h is kind of like the volume of this hypercube. I mean, when you, when you compute the area, if it's two-dimensional, then you'd have a square where the length is 2 to the h. And the height is 2 to the h. And the area, or the two-dimensional volume, is um, the size of the typical set. And 2 to the h, or h is like the exponent of the side length, or 2 to the h is the side length. Or I, I should really, I shouldn't, I've been. That's a little bit confusing the way I've been saying that. And I said that a little earlier in the lecture. I should really call it h is the log of the side length. That's really the accurate way of saying it. I'm saying it's the exponent of the side. It's not the exponent of the side length. It's the logarithm of the side length. It's the exponent of the base 2, which gives you, when you exponentiate 2 to that h, it gives you the side length. So let me correct myself. And I retract my former statements earlier in the lecture to everybody listening on YouTube who's saying, it's not the exponent of the side length. It's the logarithm of the side length. So it's really this logarithm of the side length, h's, that is. Everybody, everybody clear on that? OK. Um, so therefore, I mean, h being negative could just mean not a big deal. It says, OK, well, you got a small side length. It's 2 to the negative 10. This is a really skinny box, a really small box, right? Um, but, but when, when it corresponds to count, we don't really need h to be negative, right? Because the smallest count is 1. Smallest possible count. In the discrete case, it's a set. It's the size of a set. And it's a, it's a, it's a discrete set of, of items, right? And, um, and so the way you get a count of 1 is having h be 0. And you can't have a fractional item in a set. So there's no need, in some sense, for h ever to be negative. But when we're talking about actual volumes in Rn, then if you want to talk about a very concentrated box, you have to have negative <coughs> exponents of, um, or logs of the side lengths being negative. So here's a um, first theorem, which basically says that um, 
if you take negative 1 over n log of the density, then you get the entropy. And that's immediate consequence of the weak law of large numbers. I don't think there's anything surprising here. So we don't even need to prove it. And we can define the typical set, which is defined exactly analogously to what we saw in the discrete case, where basically it says all sequences, and you know, it, it could, it's going to be a countably infinite set, of course, but that's fine. It's a set. Um, and it's going to be finite volume. It might be countably infinite, but it's basically all sequences whose that that are epsilon. <coughs> sorry. All sequences whose probability after the one over n negative one over n log are, are epsilon close to the entropy. And we're still assuming the independence model here, so that's not that hasn't changed, at least for the moment. And so right away, just from using these definitions, we have an upper and lower bound on the probability. And as you imagine, as n gets big, these, these probabilities are going to get smaller and smaller, and we can make epsilon smaller and smaller. And we can, for any, for any epsilon, there exists an n not such that for all n greater than n not, this is going to be true. And so similarly, we're going to have all of the same kinds of things. Almost all sequences will have the same probability. Anything that happens has the same probability. This is the typical set. So we can define the volume of a region A. So it's just it's the n-dimensional volume. We just integrate over the region A. It's a very silly-looking interval. But silliness has never been a deterrent to usefulness. Um, so then we have um, the following theorem, which says that the typical set has essentially all the probability. Right? The volume has a bound, an upper and a lower bound, um, based on 2 to the nh. And the upper bound is just 2 to the nh plus epsilon, and the lower bound is 2 to the nh, to the NH minus epsilon, with the additional 1 minus epsilon fix-up factor. And you can imagine the reason for that is that the proofs are identical, which essentially they are. Um, and this is, the, this is the bound on the volume of the typical set, right? So this is not a bound on the count. We're talking about a n-dimensional volume. So here's, I think this is the point I wanted to say before. I, I had forgotten I had it here. But basically, in the discrete asymptotic equal partition property, we bound the cardinality of the typical set. The cardinality of the typical set can be either empty or size 1, but nothing less than empty it can it be. And so, therefore, the entropy being um, no less than zero is perfectly sufficient for bounding the card in this kind of expression, where this kind of expression means this. The entropy is perfectly sufficient for bounding a, a cardinality of a set, a finite set, or a discrete set. However, when we're interested in bounding a volume in Rn, if the entropy was always non-negative, there would be this lower limit volume below which we wouldn't be able to sort of be accurate with respect to it. Certainly we wouldn't be able to do upper and lower bounds. And so it makes complete sense that the entropy should be negative because, again, it's the exponent. It's in the exponent. Or in other words, the entropy is the, lo is the logarithm of the side length of the volume. Okay, so everybody clear on this point? Because I think this this point, even though it's just it's just a lowly little innocuous bullet point at the bottom of slide. Does anyone know what those numbers on the lower right mean? So I, I did this once thinking that this was an extraordinarily useful thing to do. These numbers here. Let's try in yellow. So this stuff down here. So it's lecture 17, F32 slash 43, page 99 over 164. What does that mean? It's Beamer stuff. It's Beamer stuff. So what it is, it's frame 32 out of 43 frames of the lecture, and it's PDF page 99 out of 164 PDF pages. That's what's going on. So if you're ever wondering what these numbers mean, 
Somebody's really frustrated. I hear tapping. I can hear. When is he going to finish? When is he going to finish? Is that, is that what you're thinking? Who's I don't know who's tapping, but it's. I, I, I think it's. I'll, I'll try to hurry. Okay, no, I promise. I'm just. This is filler material. Anyway, that's what those numbers mean. If you're ever wondering. But um, and I don't know why I got on that topic, but let's prove this, let's prove this thing. But this, the proofs are really easy now, because we've already done this in the discrete case. Um, so we have um, the probability of the typical set now is... Now you've got an error right there on the... Oh, you're right. How did that happen? Like the, the lecture 17 popped up to the top. Yeah, that's... When it became triple digits. Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah, that's not good. Beamer. Well, at least it's still there. So you still know it's lecture 17. If you zoom in, can you see that? That's the other thing. You can't see. I can see it on the iPad. But anyway. Yes, there's an error. Uh, there's others. There's all sorts of useful stuff at the bottom of the. Look at all this. I mean, you know what class it is. Um, you know the year. <laughs> In the quarter, you know, isn't this something that shouldn't shouldn't this be on every single slide of every lecture, mm -hmm. like the year, just in case you forgot from the previous page, or what you know, the date, you know, for those days that you write the data in the upper right hand corner of the sheet, you always have it there, right? Just handy. Um, you should get rid of all this all this stuff. It's not necessary. Um, but in any event. Um, here we um, here we have the the definition of the typical well I, I should say the probability of the typical set, which basically is by definition this and by definition greater than one itself. So this is just sort of by definition, and it's guaranteed to be true by the weak law of large numbers. Uh, in order to do the volume, we essentially go through the same proof, except in this case we're integrating and we're integrating only over the support set, and this is the extended support set. So. Just, just in case that's not clear, so basically we're only over integrating over the everything's independent, and so it's sufficient. There's, there's no instance of where there's interaction between the random variables, so that you can have support in one and support in the other, but not support jointly. So by doing this, we're, we have support everywhere. So it's guaranteed to be non-zero. And um, this is going to be greater than integrating only over the typical set, greater than or equal to. Then using our lower bound um, gives us this, and now we can just that gives us the volume, and then we, then we have our volume upper bound very easily, and the volume lower bound is the same. Here's the proof. We start with one minus epsilon. This is I think I think this is pretty straightforward. Let me know. I mean, it's exactly the same proof idea as we what we did in in the discrete case. But please let me know if this is, isn't clear. I'm not going to go through this. So, um, but the thing that's really important is the intuition. So the typical set is the smallest volume that contains essentially all of the probability. And that volume is 2 to the nh. So very, very much like what we did intuitively in the discrete case, if we look at the nth root of this volume, here's the nth root, right? we get a side length of 2 to the h. So, you know, we have some volume, which is like this big blobby thing, right, in, in dimensions. But we take the nth root, and, and we have, we know that that volume, let's use a different color. We have some blobby n-dimensional volume, right, which could be anything, and that's the typical set. Right, we know that the volume is going to be 2 to the nh, right? So now we take the nth root and we define a box. And we make the side lengths of the box equal to 2 to the h. Right? Yeah, I'm not so good at drawing more than three dimensions. I've been working on it for many years. 
But when I get up to about 23 dimensions, it just starts getting a little tr tricky. I could try the, the 17 dimensional version, but uh, I might run out of ink on the iPad. So. Um, yes, it's, it's n dimensions. But, but the point of this is, that, is the following. Is that now we've got this side length through the H, and we have a distribution over in n dimensions of, a, of a, <clears throat> an n-dimensional hyper, hypercube of a, of a distribution which is uniform in that hypercube. It's uniformly distributed over the hypercube, but it has the same entropy. So the entropy, again, is the logarithm of the side length of a volume hypercube that has the same amount of uncertainty. So yet again, another intuitive reason for why it makes sense for the entropy to be negative. And so I think what we did in, in, when we did the, you know, so this is this now the fill, filling in this hypercube, you know we're uniform there, it's a uniform distribution. And, um, okay, any questions about that idea? Okay. So therefore, it it makes sense then for entropy's meaningful range to be between negative infinity and infinity. And actually, even even like using the extended reals, like what would an entropy of infinity mean? It has infinite volume, right? If it's non-finite, it would it could mean all of R n. It means uniform. I mean, does it even make sense? I mean, th is there a uniform distribution? There, there's a there's a area of Bayesian statistics called improper priors that talks about distributions that aren't integrable, because sometimes maybe you want a uniform distribution over an infinite range, continuous range. I mean, in some sense, it's conceptual. You're saying, when it's a prior distribution, you're saying, well, I'm agnostic as to where this thing might happen. It could happen anywhere between negative infinity and infinity. So it may be possible to make those, inequal those, those strict inequalities, non-strict inequalities. And then, you know, in case it's not obvious, you know, large magnitude negative entropy really means just very, very small volume. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about differential to discrete entropy, because this is also something that's um, elucidating. Um, before I do that, let me ask if there are any questions, though. Yeah. Can we get the discrete entropy from the continuous of the, like, the line, the PDF? So well, well, actually, that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to quantize and see, see how the two relate. So, like, for example, you know, you can always, like, take a continuous distribution and partition Rn, or wherever the domain is, and then within the partition, you know, accumulate the, the probability within that region, and then assign some representative value within that region to have the probability of the region that it represents. Like a histogram. Like a histogram, except that there's no guarantee, and there's nothing that says specifically how to choose the regions. And, and we also have to have a choice as to what value. But we'll, we'll do this. We'll do an example of here. But um, histogram is, is like the same idea, where you use uniform quantize. So that's, 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 I think that's exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's like a history. But there's, it's a little bit more general than that. But the example we're going to do is basically like a histogram. So in fact, let's do this. Let's, let's take a, a continuous random variable and divide um, the range up into bins, like in a histogram bin, of, of length delta. So delta is the range of a bin. And, um, and we're going to quantize the range using n bits. So let's say that delta is equal to 2 to the n. And so here we can write this. So here's x. And each one of these lengths is delta. Now, the question of, of a representative comes up. And what we're going to do is use the mean value theorem. It basically says that um, if you take the mean value, this is one-dimensional integration, if you take the mean value then there's always so, of, of a continuous um, function, that there's always some value that represents the value of that function within the mean. So here's the expression. Right. Here's, here's the mean value, and it's basically saying 
that the mean value of the integral between i, time, I delta and i plus 1 delta is such that there exists an x of i, such that f of x i is equal to that mean value. And in pictures, here's the function, and we just choose the xi here, whose, ep, whose evaluation happens to be the mean value between here and here. Okay. Now, we create a quantized random variable, and x super delta, x sup delta, is going to be our quantized random variable that takes um, values xi, which are these mean values that we've constructed in each, in each one of these regions, um, if it's the case that x lies between i delta and i plus 1 delta. And we're going to give it a probability, which is the area under the, under the curve. So in other words, the probability of i delta here, probability of xi, is going to be the area of this whole region here. So that's going to be the probability of x of i. It's that area. And that makes sense. And that basically turns a continuous distribution into a discrete distribution. And that area is then going to be, oops, it's going to be delta times f of xi. Because remember, f of xi is the average value. We just need to multiply both that by delta to get back the integral. Because of the way that, that that's the reason why that's true is because of the way that xi is defined. So in this sense, it's it's not like it's exactly a history of it. We're choosing the xi's that were to, to, to be the representatives of each region based on this mean value property. So we can then calculate the entropy. So x delta is a discrete random variable. Now we can calculate the entropy, which sums. We've got essentially a set of probabilities now associated with each region. It's potentially infinite alphabet. And we get, um, plugging in the values, we get this. Right. And then we can separate out the two factors in the log. We can separate out into f of xi and um, log of f of xi and log of delta to get these two terms, this term, this term, and this term. OK, everybody see that? And now this term on the right, I mean, in some sense, it may be easy to see why this is true, because we're summing over i of f of xi here, delta, and then this whole other thing, log delta here, can be just brought to the right, to outside the sum. Right? It's just constant. And when, and when we do this, remember we said that each one of these values here was just p of i. And because it's a probability distribution, we sum over all i of p of i, that's going to be equal to 1, and we're going to be left with log of delta. But just to guarantee that we're doing the right thing, let's do the sum again. So it's the sum over i of delta f of xi. And remember, f of xi is this mean value, which is this. That, by definition, x of i was chosen so that f of xi was equal to that mean value. And now what we can do is we can say, okay, great, let's pull out the delta. Let's cancel this stuff out. Now we have the sum over an infinite number of regions of each one of the integral regions. The, the discrete points, there's a set of measure zero. So essentially that's, that's identical to just integrating the whole thing. So we get one. Okay. So as delta goes to zero, we have definitely that log of delta goes to infinity. And also we have that, um, you know, this, this thing here, this integral on the left, or this, sorry, this sum on the left, as delta goes to zero, uh, converges to, the, to this integral. So um, therefore, then as delta goes to zero, we, we, we've got the conditional entropy, sorry, the, the discrete entropy plus log delta 
converging to the differential entropy. But what we wanted to do is sort of for any you know, finite size delta, let's sort of see an approximate relationship for this n-bit quantization. So the approximate relationship we get is that the differential entropy is kind of like the discrete entropy plus log of delta. And then when we're doing n-bit quantization, when delta is equal to 2 to the negative n, the relationship we get is that the differential entropy is equal to, sorry, the discrete entropy is equal to the differential entropy minus log of delta, or is equal to the, the differential entropy plus n. So there's the relationship, really, between the differential and the discrete entropy, in, in this case when the discrete entropy is obtained by this quantization process. So therefore, it, it is not surprising that um, as n gets bigger and bigger, meaning our quantization becomes more and more accurate, the entropy can get bigger and bigger as well. And that, that's, also, that's the reason why it's not surprising, is because the number of discrete values uh, increases. Right, that we're taking, you know, so like for example, if it was uniform distribution, it would increase as log n. Now, I guess I've already answered that question, why? But it, it also just makes sense, because when we have a continuous random variable, and we quantize it to n-bit accuracy, and if we just had a discrete random variable with um, 2 to the n values, um, we would expect that the entropy goes up with n, because there are just more values. And n is the is the maximum entropy, but in general, like we have more and more values, each of which are assigned more and more probabilities, and so the prob so it should go up linearly in the same sense. But at the same time, the differential entropy is, is part of the picture too, right? So the different, the continuous, the discrete entropy is equal to the differential entropy plus plus n, right? And so um, the the discrete entropy is the number of bits needed to describe this sort of n bit equally spaced quantization of the continuous random variable x. And um, when we say that this, when we, when we make this approximate relationship, and I see a typo there, it should just be approximately, there's no additional in, equal needed there, um, that it kind of says, well, how, how many bits you need to describe this quantization really depends on the quantization of n. In the worst of cases, it's kind of like it, it would be log of n. Right? Um, in which case, you know, the, di the differential entropy would be something like log of n minus n. Right. But on the other hand, if, f if it's very, very concentrated, if the distribution is, very, if, if the entropy is very, very negative, then it, it could be something like, um, you know, it could be many fewer bits than n. Whereas if it's very spread out, it might be more bits than n. So but the point is that it's, it's dependent, you know, it sort of goes linearly, the quantization, the entropy is linearly related to the differential entropy in this way. Okay, any questions on that? It means to be a little of what you said last week about how there's a real number, one real number between zero and one that can go and go through the answer to everything. And, uh, like, so if you had a channel where you could transmit one real number, you only need to do it once. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a little bit related. First of all, the, the mystical magical number omega is, is not just any real number. It's a really, truly mystical, magical number of Omega. And I will, we will talk about it. If you really want to find out about that number, come, come to visit the class next quarter, or come take the class next quarter. But, you know, in, if you think about any irrational number between 0 and 1, I mean, it has infinite length, right? So it, it sort of has infinite information, potentially. Um, like the number pi, does pi repeat? Like, if you wanted to represent pi exactly as a, as a decimal expansion of a number? So, I mean, it's not between 0 and 1, but, you know, scale it so it's between 0 and 1. Um, it's, so it's somewhat related, and we're actually going to talk about that, because when, when we talk about transmitting something that, has, that is from a real alphabet as opposed to a discrete alphabet, 
What does it mean? Um, what does it mean to say, okay, I've got one message, I've got a continuous channel, and I want to send that one irrational infinite length number over this channel? Doesn't, wouldn't that mean I'm sending infinite information, since that number could be arbitrarily long? So that, that aspect of, of the idea of what you just said is actually true even of numbers that are not this mystical magical number. That basically, you know, each, each one, there are lots of numbers that, that would contain infinite, infinite information, even if they wouldn't. And, and to be honest, actually, if you have this mystical magical number, you could multiply by any other number, including a ratio of any other number to that number, and you get back that number. The ratio, the magic is in the ratio. So, so it's really, it's there's some, there's different, there's a little bit of a difference there. But I think what you're getting at is really the idea that you, you get, you, what does it mean to have infinite resolution and finite information? And that's something that we can't, can't really talk about until we talk about the Gaussian channel, which we will talk about uh, first week of next quarter, January second or something, right? Yeah, I think it's January third. I, I can't remember when the quarter begins next quarter. So are there any other questions? Because I think this is actually a good uh, break point. Um, I was going to talk about joint differential entropy, but this is a natural place to break. So are there other questions? Do you like this material? Let me ask you a question. Is this cool? I think it's interesting. But um, does everybody get the idea of the entropy being the logarithm of a side length of a, of a uniform volume? So that, that, I think, is really the core, core intuition, beyond what we already knew. OK, so um, I will see you all on Thursday. Because I feel very strongly about education, I don't think we should take holidays. We should have class. And I was going to have a, a second midterm on Friday. I hope you don't mind. Um, we're going to be meeting here at 6 in the morning on Friday. Um, I'll see you all Friday morning at 6 and Thursday afternoon at our usual time. Thank you very much. <laughs>